Welcome to this session. Wow. That's a lot of people. Let me just quickly take a picture of that. Wow. Um, welcome, everyone, to this session, um, which is the inception session, basically, for me, for this talk. This thing is brand new, literally. I just like finished the slides a couple of minutes ago. Um, and it's close and dear to my heart because um, yeah, it's something that I just like spent a lot of time on. And I see quite a lot of teams building APIs, RESTful APIs, that start with good intentions, and then along comes versioning, and things just go downhill from there. Um, just kidding. So devil's advocate, if you guys are sitting in this talk, um, does that mean you're, you're not actually writing Evolve the REST APIs these days? Is that the case? Um, my name is Oliver Gierke. Um, oh, let me check this. Uh, my name is Oliver Gierke. I work for a company called Pivotal. You probably heard of that. Um, I'm actually in the Spring Data project lead, so mostly spend most of my time on um, the data access project, so Spring Data, JPA, MongoDB, what have you. So if you've ever used that kind of um, code, that's basically my team's work. And um, beyond that, or basically in the, in the time before I actually did that, I spent a lot of time with customers and building APIs and what have you. And it's sort of kind of that stuck around. And um, there's also a module in the Spring Data ecosystem, Spring Data REST, that takes a bit of these experiences that we have here, or that I'm basically going to present, uh, in, and basically puts them into code, into, into executable code. So what do I actually want to do well, let's start with what I do not want to do. Um, this talk is not about URI design. This talk about is not about like, okay, how do I, what what HTTP methods do we use or what have you. I want to take a look at the way we build REST APIs and basically a look at how we actually got there. Why do we build them in a way that we build them today? Is what we think is a REST API really a REST API? And if not, what's the problem with that? Is there even a problem? Maybe it's not, right? And the fundamental thing that REST boils down to is basically a set of architectural constraints that lead or promise to actually lead to certain architectural traits. In other words, from the set of options you have, we take away quite a few. And by limiting yourself and allowing yourself to limit you into, that, into those constraints, you actually get some effects, you get some benefits, right? And um, in a world of microservices or, let's say, systems uh, interacting with other systems or overall systems being composed of a multitude of systems, the evolvability aspect is becoming quite an important one. Because, again, a step back, back from software and architecture, why do we want to build microservices in the first place? We want to ship features faster. We want to be more agile, right? And shipping features faster m might mean adding a new service to the overall service landscape, but it mostly means being able to alter the service according to new features, right? So we want to change the thing. So it might not be the best option to actually focus on just how to quickly build something because I can replace that even later, maybe, right? Build for replaceability, basically. But what people often forget about that is that they actually have to rebuild the very same API so that the other downstream systems still continue to work, right? So I've basically tried to um, separate this talk into three different um, sections, right? So I want to take a look at a bit of context. As I said, how do we, how do we actually get here? Um, what, in what kind of context do we actually build APIs, and do different contexts actually uh, require building different kinds of APIs? Um, we're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about abstraction levels. What, what abstraction level does or do extra, abstraction levels do APIs convey actually? And um, we're also going to talk about uh, the topic of coupling, right? Because if there's evolvability we need low coupling, and how do we actually achieve that? All right, some context. Um, back in the days, like around the 2000s or something, is anyone that old in the audience? Probably not, right? It's, I'm the only one. So 
If, if you remember, you, if you vaguely remember, there was a time when we actually built AP, applications, web applications, that were actually serving HTML. Can you imagine that? Right? That's weird. Why would you do that? So we had an application that was like acting or communicating with the database that was turning some kind of business logic into an HTML template. JSPs, I hear you. Right? And then we sent this HTML to a browser, and the browser did what it does best. It actually displays or renders that HTML, right? Um, fast forward five, six, seven years, we thought the browser actually, although it's good at HTML, there's probably something we can do better, right? Let's put some JavaScript in between. Where's, which bears a bit of irony, right? So we decide not to send the browser the HTML to just display, but rather send it some kind of weird other format, curly braced format, to then have some JavaScript to render some HTML to then give to the browser. Right? That's basically like ordering a pizza or ordering the ingredients of a pizza so that you can assemble it yourself at home. Really. But what happened with that, and I actually Okay, there's a bit of, bit of blame to share here. I actually blame the JavaScript, some of the JavaScript frameworks for that. Um, what is interesting here is that now all of a sudden we needed to sort of like get some data to actually or to, to, to translate into HTML in the first place, right? So what they, the, most of these, these frameworks that we're actually doing was like, okay, we just need some HTTP endpoint that we can query for some, for some JSON data. Right? So what has formerly been like a capsule for application logic has now become actually a data access layer over HTTP. Right? Um, and there's two, two sides to this. One is that we basically lifted up the CRUD level. So if, you, if you're familiar with Spring Data or a Spring Data application, um, it's just like an operation. You simulate a collection of entities or aggregates, and then you can like persist them, you can query them, you can change them, repersist them, what have you. Right? That's basically the, the abstraction level that you're acting on. And if you're just thinking of that, that piece of Java code, where does the actual business logic reside? It resides in front of it. Right? It's not in the repository, it's in front of the repository. So what we do is we lift up the repository abstraction level to, H to the HTTP level, which means we also have to shift the business logic in front of it, which is where it usually, usually lands, like in some kind of like JavaScript framework. We put some validation on the client. We have to actually put the very same business logic or validation rules on the server, right? So that's actually a, fun, a pretty good first thing to start with. You're not, not actually moving business logic to the client, but you replicate it, which already means that you have two places where you have to maintain it. Right? So validating whether something is a valid credit card number now has to happen on the server and on the client. Because if you only have it on the client, then like, OK, what, what do you expose? A database without any constraints, or what is it? Um, so you're replicating it, which means you have to keep it, both of them in sync, right? So along comes the iPhone. When was it? 2007 or something? Was it? Is it that old already? Um, and the golden age of mobile basically pops up. So we now have clients that actually not want to render HTML. I mean, they, you could maybe even use a, a web application on your, on your mobile, uh, but it's the, the area of uh, iOS of native, native mobile apps, right? Which, with keep, or when keeping the same abstraction level in the APIs, it means that we, again, have to replicate um, the very same front-end logic into a new client. So we now have three places where we actually have to maintain that business logic, right? All right, let's see what, what, what we can do about this. This is, it's just that, okay, this is the, the, the picture that you usually see these days. You have like some kind of front-end applications talking to an API that's mostly a glorified data access layer, isn't it? So, um, the other aspect that comes up is 
the question, okay, we build different services. We have front-end services and we have back-end services. And um, in effect, you actually have services that talk to each other, right? And the, the, that is, or the differentiation between front-end and back-end services is kind of, or it, there's an underlying assumption here. And the assumption is that for some services, I know all the clients, and for some services, I don't don't know them, or I don't control them, or what have you, right? Um, but if you think about it, if you're building a system of systems, and I'm going to have a talk about that tomorrow, um, you're actually working in a landscape where every, little, every hour, or every day, or every week, there could be a new service popping up in that landscape that's using your API, right? So I'd raise the question of whether that dis or that making that difference between these kinds of services is actually that useful. Because like, if you want to keep track of all the clients that actually use your software or your backend services, um, that might become quite, quite hard. I mean, how many services is Netflix? A couple of thousands, right? So do you know all the clients even in the backend services? No, right? So there's a, a fundamental idea that I will go into tomorrow in much uh, deeper level in the System of Systems workshop, is that even in a distributed system, you want to limit the amount of interaction between the services quite a bit, right? Because you want agility amongst the systems, and the less you have to talk to other systems, and the less you have to talk across teams, the more agile you can actually be, right? If every change you want to make requires you to coordinating or to coordinate with other teams, you're basically ending up or have ended up in a distributed monolith because you have to synchronize deployments, what have you. So the point I'm trying to get across here is that w in a world of like distributed systems making up and overall systems, that evolvability aspect is much more, impor uh, much more important than if you're just like building a monolith, right? Because you, there's, there's no point in actually splitting up the system if like a change in one system requires you to actually redeploy like five other systems because you basically broke that, that, that API. So it's fundamentally about the relationship between a service that is actually is exposing an API and the service that's con consuming an API. And there's a, there's a couple of flavors that you can have here, especially for the JavaScript application. Um, some people argue, okay, um, we are in charge of the client, right? We build the, the front-end application and we build the server application, so there's, there's, there's no problem with it, right? So while that's fine for JavaScript applications, um, what about the, the mobile applications, right? Yeah, of course, we do the releases for the mobile uh, applications. We go ahead and then deploy them to the iOS or the, Apple's, uh, the App Store, and yeah, okay, but um, are you in charge of the deployment of the clients, really? You're usually not, right? So, I mean, who actually says that like, all, your, all your users are actually um, installing the new update right away, right? So that's kind of like putting constraints on the way you can actually change things and evolve things. Um, and coming back to the issue I, or the, the aspect I just mentioned is, okay, for, for backend services, if you want to, if you want to call them, is do you know your clients? Yeah, okay, might be a good idea, right? If I know that another team in my company is using is using my API, and the question I'd raise is, do you really want that? Do you really want to know your your other clients, right? Do you really want to interact with them all the time? Do you really want to uh, like wait for requests for them to to change stuff or what have you? So there's there's a bit of the less you know, the less you, ha you actually care about your, not care, that's the wrong word, but the less you have to actually interact uh, with your clients um, on a coordination level, uh, the better. So trying to avoid that is, is a good thing. So if you can avoid it, right? Um, all right, let's get, get, get back to that uh, in a bit. So abstraction level, I already mentioned, I, I already mentioned that um, in a bit. Um, there is a, some slide I borrowed from a guy called Stefan Tilkov, a very, very um, good talk of him, um, as most of them. Uh, microservices, patterns, and anti-patterns um, is basically discussing on what abstraction level we build an API. 
So the first and the easiest thing to build in the first place is just like throwing data or basically taking a relational database table, flipping it by 90 degree, calling the table columns field names and make it turn it into JSON and then just like throw it over the fence, right? So that's just like CRUD via HTTP, data, database access level, basically. Um, as I already mentioned, if you lift that kind of abstraction up to HTTP, where does your business logic go? You basically shift it in front of you, like you push it right out of the way to the, to the client. Um, so the next level you could actually uh, take in, in this regard is like, instead of just like blindly throwing database tables over the fence, you could build a domain model, right? And um, then actually shape reasonable sized aggregates, reasonably sized resources. Um, that's something that you not actually have on that on that lower level because it doesn't actually know anything about relationships of tables or different kinds of relationships in in your data. So this, as I, as I mentioned before, the the Spring Data REST module is exactly doing that, and that makes it a good foundation for the next level. Actually, it's not even, and that's where I constantly have to argue. It's not even thought of as a module to build a REST API, just like just flip on Spring Data REST and you'll be done. It's just taking away the boilerplate parts. There will be parts of your API where you're just like, okay, creating some, some entities and just like um, reading them back, filtering them, pagi uh, paginating them, um, that's it. But it's actually, it exists to allow you to take more time to, uh, to build, build the interesting stuff on top of that, which is process flow. So we get to an example in a bit, but um, the idea is that like, with just manipulating data, you're not actually achieving any, or that's, that's not where the business value is coming from, right? If I, and that's what, we, that's what the example will be about, if it's, if it's about um, an order experience, so I wanna place an order, uh, I wanna add some items to the, to, the, to, the, to, a, to the order, some line items, and then I wanna trigger the payment, in this case it's a coffee ordering system, so I want to pay, which basically triggers in the back end the preparation of something and then comes back and with a result or what have you in a long running process. That's kind of a different level of abstraction, right? You, you're, you're operating on, on, on some, some language that's much closer to uh, the actual business needs, right? So when you're, when you're shipping or when you're buying a book at Amazon, you're not going, oh, I want to create an an order entity in the Amazon system, right? You're just like going there, taking the book, adding it to the cart, going to the checkout. So you, you, you're operating on a, on a much higher level, right? Right, so and the, the, next, the most top level, I'm just adding it here for completeness because that's what the slide looked like in Stefan's presentation. Um, he's talking about like the integration of systems on the presentation level as like a self-contained systems architecture. That's what I'm going to mention tomorrow. Um, my point here being we have different levels of abstraction and we can actually see or have a look at what it actually means to raise the abstraction level, right? Because if we just take that CRUD, oper that, 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 that CRUD operation abstraction level and basically pull that up to the HTTP level, um, that adds cost. HTTP is not, a, not an inexpensive protocol, right? You need to, I mean, HTTP2 is um, mitigating some of the costs here but if you're not getting any benefits of um, what REST promises and what HTTP promises, um, then what's the point, really, right? It's, yeah, that's the thing. So what benefits do you get? Um, actually, it's, it was funny because uh, Ray was talking right before me, and he was like suggesting, oh, are you talking about gRPC then? And I was like, or, or we were discussing things that I might not like giving my given my background, he's like, you're probably not a fan of gRPC, and actually, I'm, I am, right? In, all, in, in quite a few cases, it would have been the better way to actually implement uh, systems interaction, uh, because if you're, if you're like building just a CRUD API via HTTP, then you could just have used gRPC and not have spent the overhead of an HTTP connection and um, redo reopening connections and what have you. So the efficiency topic is coming up. In, in this regard, if you're just like moving that low-level abstraction API to HTTP. And another way to actually phrase it and an interesting way to think about it is that people often tell me 
they just want to use CRUD APIs because it's so generic, right? So they, they, they can build clients in the very same way. They can access customers. It's just like it gets to slash customers, what have you, and it's the same for everyone. Ironically, and that doesn't actually couple the, the, the client and the server too much. Ironically, it actually does because all the business logic has now to move or has to be replicated on the client. And you have to keep that in sync. With business logic, I mean, okay, when is which operation allowed? I mean, wh how do you actually even model operations in, in, uh, in that area? Right? It's, it's usually just like poking at data, getting a resource, changing some fields, and patching it back. That's kind of that's the, the abstraction level, and that's very, very low level here. So if we, if we take this again and move this over to this side, what we usually see nowadays is APIs that basically draw the line somewhere in the middle of the domain logic. I just like, kept that, uh, that, um, that split um, right in the middle there, because just to make obvious that we're actually, we actually have to uh, replicate some of the stuff between a client and the server. Um, and that creates coupling. Right, so if I want to change uh, some business rules that I want to check or have to check for on the server and have replicated into the client, then I'd actually um, have to change them at the same time. And um, it maybe, I mean, what if we just could get up to this thing, actually, to this level? If we could have the API designed on a process flow level and maybe remove even some, some knowledge from the client, make it dumber in some way, so that it's easier to keep in sync with, with, with the server. Right. Which brings me to the topic of coupling. Right. So we've just, or the, basically the summary of the last 20 minutes is um, if you have that low-level API abstraction, you create a quite, a quite a bit of coupling between clients and servers, which, of course, negatively impacts the evolvability. Right. So contracts not what you think it is, um, or not, it's, I don't want to talk about what you might want to, or might think I want to talk about this way around. I want to have a, a look at the way we define interfaces in Java in the first place. Let's start with that. You're probably all Java developers. When we define an interface, let's say there's some service that is about to create a user account and what have you, and then we have this user account class, there's a salutation in there, a private field, that's an enum. Does that even compile? I'm not sure. You know what I'm, where, I'm, where I'm getting at. It's like coding in Keynote, that's weird. Um, but the, the thing here being, okay, if we're, if we're specifying that interface in Java, we're using a very strong means of, or type definition, a strongly typed language, um, the compiler checks that whenever we use an enum value on the client that it actually exists in that type because we've defined it. So it's, it's, really, it's really, even if, if, if the client calls the method, we cannot just like change the method or a field or what have you and not update the client at the same time. Actually, it's a benefit because we can use our refactoring means. If I rename the method using my Eclipse slash IntelliJ uh, keyboard shortcuts, then it's updated or changed on the server, on the, on the interface, and on the, uh, on the client code at the same time, right? We can, we can use that strong coupling for, for, our, for our benefit. And there's quite well understood rules of what you can do to an API like this, right? It's, um, um, you can, what can you do to an API? You can, can you remove a method? No, you can't, right? You, can you add a method? Yeah, you can generally add things, right? Can you add things? Um, what if the client code resided in a separate, in a separate jar file, and um, on the server we decided to add, or on the on the service on the on the providing side of the API, we decided to add an enum value. Would the old version of the client still be able to deal with that? It wouldn't, right? So let's say we, f instead of Mr. and Miss, we just add professor, what have you. So there's, there's some brittleness in there. There's the strength in coupling, which we can use for our benefit, but it's also brittle, right? Because it's easy to break clients that are not co-located with this code. And what I find surprisingly puzzling is that 
people think that they could employ the very same means of defining a contract between a client and a server system for their RESTful APIs, they just literally do the same. Swagger, I'm looking at you, right? So it's kind of like very strongly, def strongly defined contracts, but at the same time expect to end up with something completely different, end up with something loosely coupled where they can just change things. No, they can't. They just end up with the very same. If you employ the same means to define an API or define the specification for an API, then you end up with the same API characteristics. That seems to be pretty obvious. There was this, was it an Einstein quote? Is it like retrying the same thing and expecting different outcomes? That's kind of, that's kind of a weird thing to do, right? So what is the mechanism that's, that's at play here? That's a thing called connaissance. Has anyone ever heard of the term connaissance? Literally nobody. That's awesome. You guys have learned something today. Uh, if it's just a weird word that so far doesn't ha seem to have been important, right? Um, it goes back to a, a guy called Mil Miller. I always kind of like mispronounce his name. Mr. Page Jones. Let's stick with that. Um, in a book that's almost 20 years old, um, it's probably not that often read anymore because it has UML in its title. Um, and the, 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 the talk that actually got me onto this thing was uh, um, Jim Wyrick's talk, Grand Unified Theory. I'm not sure how I actually even got to watch a talk that's named like this, but it actually talks about connaissance and it has a very good summary and a good, good short introduction into it. Um, fundamentally, it's about the strength of coupling and the different, uh, different uh, levels of strength of coupling. Right? So it basically says, okay, when you have like two things that are born at the same time, that, that belong together, um, what, or what cost or what, uh, what change do you actually have to if you want to alter one thing, how expensive is it to keep this other thing compatible with it? So um, it, that's basically the, the fundamental definition. So you, it's a degree of coupling, basically. And there's also an, um, a locality aspect to it. So uh, the, Mr. Page Jones actually defines that for, for the, if you have these two parties, if they are co-located, if they are very close to each other, then a stronger form of connaissance is acceptable, it's even desired, than for things that are more remote, where remote means not controlled at the same time, right? So uh, closely related, and that's, it says that um, like with uh, the more distance the, the involved elements are, the higher dif we have a higher difficulty and cost of change, right? So there are, it's, it's not even, it's not rocket science really, there's a connaissance of name, connaissance of type, connaissance of meaning, and um, it's basically, if you, if you think about a method, right? If, um, if you just have a, a, let's say, named method parameters, and you could imagine a language that had that, right? Uh, named method parameters, then if you have names and you, if you, you can, um, assign values to a certain name, say first name is foo and last name is bar, then the order of the parameters doesn't actually even matter, right? So you can just like uh, use them in any order. I've heard Kotlin does that. So if you have a type definition, a structural type, that's kind of a uh, stronger coupling already, um, a connaissance of meaning is basically if you transfer, let's say zero or one, and that represents true or false, right? that just the fact that a value represents another, another thing is connections of meaning and then position and algorithm, what have you. So the idea is, the fundamental idea is that for, let's say, less closely related um, parties, you want to actually stay very low, you want to stay with low connections. So if you can avoid actually getting into the uh, connections of type, but only, um, um, base, base your, your interaction on connections of name, that makes a lot less coupling than it does if you just go ahead and document uh, a lot of types. And ultimately, um, most of the API documentation generation tools that I am aware of, they actually 
um, quite heavily invest in that connections of type thing, right? So they inspect your, uh, your, your type system, enum values get documented and like put into the documentation and what have you, right? So we'll see how we can actually um, get uh, to uh, lower levels of connections in, 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 uh, in, in an example in a bit. Uh, one thing I just wanted to have a quick look in a look at is the topic of versioning. Anyone read that? Yeah. So th 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 that's the usual solution you have. Like you have these people like building these kinds of APIs, um, pub basically publishing data via HTTP, and say, okay, um, we sort of have to detect a breaking change in our API, and then we just like change the version number, and then we just like put this up, and then everything's fine. The thing is, um, versioning an API is not actually evolving it, because you're literally like throwing the old thing away and just build a new service. That's what it is, right? Because there's this, like structurally, you might convey, okay, in the 2.0 thing, like everything but that hasn't changed, that's fine, but structurally, or like from a from a um, from a from an implementation effort point of view, it's just a, a new service, basically. Right? It, okay, you can copy a lot of stuff, but you still have to you have to run this thing. You have to uh, make sure that the clients are actually communicating what versions they are they are using and what have you. There is um, actually a quite interesting um, paper by a guy called Jack Jack Dubré. Um, pretty. It's not, it's not that new anymore. I think it's 2013 or something. A blog post, Understanding the Cost of Versioning of an API. He has, um, he, he has comes up with some formulas and some, some scientific measure to actually yeah, really evaluate how much adding a new version of a service adds an effort, adds to, uh, uh, to the overall services landscape. And there's um, a point-to-point -point integration, compatible versions integration, so basically not breaking the API, so, um, or having a new version that's um, um, compatible with the old one, which, which doesn't actually qualify as version then, but you, I think you get the point across. Uh, and um, the not is basically, okay, we have, we, have, uh, we have to move clients to new APIs because of breaking changes, actually. If you're interested in that, there's an InfoQ article about that, and the, one, uh, the, the blog post has all the, all the details, right? So what I'm trying to actually get to is that, okay, if I basically, my theory is that version is not the ultimate solution or not an option or whatever you want to phrase it, then we sort of have to change our attitude, right? So, um, because the, the, the question I usually get is like, okay, how do we actually do versioning? And then I say, okay, have you tried some other things, which I just go into in a second? Uh, no, we didn't use that mechanism that actually REST uh, has for, for, for trying to keep the coupling low. Um, no, we don't actually need that. Yeah, but you've just asked me how to version your system. It pretty makes or makes pretty obvious that you actually have the needs to actually do that. So the, the, uh, the it's a fundamental different idea if you actually go ahead and start designing a system and think about it. Okay, how do I actually uh, design it in a way that it's less likely that I have to introduce a breaking change? And there's like there's very concrete things that you can do. Um, that doesn't actually mean that you'll get away with it entirely and that you're never going to have to introduce a version of your service. It's just that all the pain starts much later. Right? All right. So was that obvious? For some people, it might have been. Right? So there is this, this thing called hypermedia, and it's, um, it's sort of a pet peeve of mine, not just because I'm like one of the co-authors of the Spring Hate Us um, project. Um, it's that it, it's it's something that has like kept me or that kept me busy for 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 quite a while already. Um, and I very often meet people that tell me, "Okay, we've tried this thing and it's not really working, and so we've just stopped doing it again." Right. So, and I hope I actually be able to to convey an example that sort of communicates, okay, why I think that it might actually help to build these kinds of evolvable systems. Um, it's not necessarily about the fact itself that you're using hypermedia in your API, but it's a fundamental 
shift in how you think about stuff you do, really. So what is hypermedia in the first place? It's basically links and representations. So you're not only serving data in the first place, but you also put links into your representation. If you're, if you're lucky enough that you have an API that serves HTML as the re uh, re representation or the media type, which you can do, and uh, quite a few people actually successfully do, then th that's no problem because HTML knows the anchor tag, or oh, not the anchor, yeah, the anchor tag, that's, that's right. Uh, so you basically have an anchor named with that has an href attribute so you can point to something different. For JSON, you usually have to then uh, open the Pandora's box of hypermedia formats in JSON, HAL, Collection JSON, Siren, Uber, what have you. Um, but fundamentally, the idea is that you just equip your responses with, uh, with links so that a client can actually find these links and use them. And that's the important bit, and that's oftentimes the, the bit where things go downhill because uh, there's n not much point in adding all these links if you don't have clients that actually use them. If they just choose to ignore them, then those cl uh, clients will usually break if you like rely on being able to change things here and there. Um, I know of a project, a, a um, travel booking agency in, in Berlin, actually. They are, um, they have some kind of like URI, URI chaos monkey in their CI system, so they deliberately change URIs in their, in their uh, CI environments to see whether a client might have just like bound to a particular path segment or what have you, uh, to make sure that the clients are actually using it, so. And then there's this thing here, hypermedia as the engine of application state, hey to us, whatever you want to call it, what's that? Um, if hypermedia is links, what does that add to it? Um, it's basically serving the links conditionally and then building the clients in a way that they can actu they actually act on the presence of links. So the client is not actually expecting a link to be there, it's literally built in a way that says, if link foobar is present, then do something, or display a button to actually trigger an action, what have you. Right? So it's kind of that, that, that idea that um, instead of like closely inspecting the payload, the client is more looking for the links and uh, is looking for, uh, for the presence of the links and also like derives um, kind of knowledge from the non-presence maybe even, right? So the example that I usually like pull out of my sleeve um, f for that is called Restbox. It's a part of a book called Rest and, uh, Rest and Practice. It's also quite a, quite a few years old already. It's a coffee ordering experience that's close to uh, what Starbucks does. So you basically have your order is kind of a state machine and that's why REST is representational state transfer, right? So you have a resource or resources that you actually move through different states. Um, the order is can just be placed, first, uh, first state transition, it can be updated, second state transition, it can be canceled or can be prepared. Um, that's actually the fourth state transition is like issuing a payment, or that's at least how I chose to implement it later on. And then uh, there's some backend process going on, uh, preparing the order, and at some point it's it, it becomes done and then it has to be taken and then that's sort of sort of it, right? So if you naively go ahead and basically try to come up with a specification the way I usually see people do API specifications, then the first thing they do is just like reserve a week of a meeting room to discuss URI uh, structures, right? So should it be uh, orders 4711 slash payment or should it be payment what have you? Point is, it doesn't matter really. It's not. It's not really of importance. But I get to that in a sec. Um, so that's basically the resource space that you could come up with. And the way you document it, or usually document it, is just looks like this. It's URI uh, structures, and um, there's some kind of gotcha in the in the let's say in the cancel order uh, action. It says only if in payment expected. Right, and then you have probably, if you're good, you actually have some kind of prose that documents what that actually means, right? What does payment expected actually mean? And how is a client able to detect that? Um, right, so that's, that's the thing here. What should get obvious here is, again, 
we are at a very low abstraction level because we have just this tree of resources, but let's say you're a developer and you want to build an, an app for that that's like willing or it's, that is supposed to actually implement um, the, the coffee ordering process. I mean, is this helpful? Would you want to go ahead and say, okay, now I have to look up all the resources. Oh, there's a, okay, there's a post I can do, and then uh, I probably need to pay, but how do I actually even know that paying triggers the preparation process? It's, it's just like, okay, you, it, it's like a giant piece of Legos and nobody telling you how to actually build that cool uh, Millennium Falcon from it, right? So as you've seen down there. Um, so the low abstraction level is basically leaking into the documentation because there's just nothing more there if, you, if, you, if that's all your API basically exposes, right? Right. So let's say um, we've sort of implemented something. We've implemented something. We've implemented uh, the API, so we have an order of 4711, and um, th it has this created date, and it has the status, yada, 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 payment expected. So how does the client now actually know whether it could cancel that? Let's stick with the cancellation example. How does the client know? That's the question, right? So there's two options. First one is inspecting the payload. Right? So we could write some documentation that goes ahead and says, dear client, if the status is payment expected, you can issue a request to a delete, re or no, what is a delete request to uh, order slash ID, and then that will actually cancel the order. Right? So we basically took the, the low abstraction level of what could be derived from the, from, the, from the code or what have you, if you're using any kind of tooling that's actually uh, d uh, deriving that uh, from code, and added some pros so that we sort of try to raise the abstraction level. But that actually leads to what? Yeah, to the client. There's probably some client code that says if status dot, uh, or if your yeah, order dot status equals payment expected, then um, show the button, the cancellation button, period. That's it. Okay, that's fine. Ship it. Right? We can do that. It's fine. We can ship the client. We can ship the server. And now along comes the business and says, yikes. Right? So for us Germans, well, that would probably mean that the status has to change to, uh, what is it, to a again or something. I'm not sure what it is, what it is in Spanish. But uh, that's the usual reaction here. <laughs> because we've painted ourselves into a corner, really. And what is, what is the reason we painted ourselves into the corner? It's not that we've had to teach the client that there's a status field or that it's a first name field or what have you. And that's, that's usually the reaction I get. I somehow have to tell the client something about the structure. Yes, of course. But the problem is not in the left side of the key value pair. It's not about the problem. I mean, you want to rename a field, fine. That's like, that's like bread and butter examples. But the problem is that we, that we coupled to the left side. We coupled semantics to the left side, to the values. Right? And where is this coming from? Because our server documentation just listed the value and then said, okay, a particular value is, has actually some business semantics. And we replicated those that business rule into the client because the documentation said status payment expected means the order can be cancelled. Right? That's a business rule. But should that business rule actually be copied into the client? That's ca exactly causing uh, that issue. Right? So what can we do different in this case? So instead of doing that, we could just go ahead and say, dear client, we're not going to tell you what the exact business rule about the cancellation is, we just send you a link. And if that link is present, you can derive from that um, that, the, uh, that the order can be cancelled. Right? So with, with the lack of information, so the, 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 the fundamental idea here is we're not telling the client everything. That's a, a usual developer kind of phenomenon. right? So there's a lot of information in our server-side code. So if we can just gather that and then give that to the client-side developers, that's a good thing. No, it's not, because it creates the coupling we want to avoid. Right? So it's 
it's just as important to know what not to document as it is to know what to document. And oftentimes, these, the, the tooling uh, that we ha use these days is kind of like inf gathering information, gathering information, and then the, it's, that's fine, it's easy for a, for a first implementation, but it actually hinders us from evolving that API, from changing the things, right? So back to that, got to hurry up a bit. Um, we can now, if we, if we change the server to still put the status field in there, but actually not tell the client about any semantics of payment expected, uh, we can just like put the, the cancel link in here, and we can literally implement the client in a way that says, if link underscore links dot cancel, uh, then uh, display the button, what have you. And then in this case, the business could even decide, guess what? You can also cancel the order even if the drink was successfully prepared, right? What, what would it require to actually ship that change in business rules to the client? Yeah, just adding that link in a different state. It's a server side change only, right? So what we've done is we've simplified the decisions significantly. We've, we, took away, um, we took away domain knowledge, we took away the, the knowledge about like domain internals and basically replaced it with some protocol information. Right? So we made the client smarter and dumber at the same time. We made it smarter about uh, like how do I actually find links? What is hell? Uh, what is a URI template? All these things, but we actually took away domain knowledge. And why is that a good idea? Why, why would you do that? Yeah, your domain rules might change, and they usually change more often than hell changes the way it represents links or the way URI templates look or what have you. Right? So er to on the side of the, the, the thing that changes less. So to make that a bit graphical is I have this non-hypermedia-based system that's basically option one, option two, hypermedia-based system. And the thing is that like, the amount of domain knowledge directly relates to the coupling, in the amount of domain knowledge in the client. Right? And if you can actually replace that by rather moving to protocol knowledge, um, that actually reduces the, the, the coupling here. All right. To round things off, you're at a spring conference, right? So what, I mean, that's all nice talk, and, but are there any spring projects that actu actually help you building these kinds of things? Of, I mean, of course, there's gotta be spring Helios. It's like the, the fundamental thing that allows you just to add links, to create links, to conditionally add them. Uh, we currently support HAL as media type mostly, uh, there's like collection JSON support coming um, and we're planning to extend that into, into other hypermedia formats. Um, there is a project called Spring Restox. I'm not sure whether the talk on it has, still, uh, has already taken, uh, taken place. It takes a different approach of documenting APIs by, um, by rather um, just like executing your, um, your uh, API and um, basically br breaking, if, if, if there's a field in the JSON that you didn't actually document, it actually breaks the test so that you can always be sure that the documentation and your server production code is in, s in sync, right? With Swagger, you just like put an annotation that says status codes returned, uh, whatever, 401, 402, what have you, and three lines below, there's some code that says, oh, let's throw 403. Right? There's no problem in actually that happening. If you just like look at static information, that's not sufficient really. Um, and uh, something uh, just I want to briefly mention, a, a good idea to, or a, a tiny thing that actually changes things quite a bit is not shipping um, those docs or those specifications if you have JSON schema or what have you, not shipping them as a separate kind of developer portal kind of thing, but as part of your API because they make obvious that this thing is something that could change, right? You could have like uh, cache headers, max age that basically say, okay, this this uh, JSON specification only is only valid for the na next uh, couple of hours or something, or even a day, and that basically reduces the incentives for clients to actually generate st strongly typed code that's expecting that thing to live forever or to look forever like it, like it does. Right? Um, there's also another uh, cool project by a colleague, Marcin, Spring Cloud Contract. Um, I've been like a bit or defensive about like contracts and strong contracts. Um, it's actually a, a very cool tool about like if, you, if you're into consumer-driven testing, contract testing, it may totally makes it easy to actually define these consumer-driven consumer contracts. Um, 
consumer-driven contracts are a bit more or get a bit more problematic if you raise the abstraction level, if you get into all these hypermedia things, then Spring Cloud Contract doesn't actually become useless or something. It's uh, a nice tool in combination with REST docs for you to generate wire mock stops for your clients. So you can have like like provider-driven contracts, basically. You can, can generate a stop from your hypermedia-based API implementation um, and uh, in combination with REST docs so that the tools uh, work, work together pretty seamlessly. So to summarize, um, favor high-level APIs over CRUD ones because you don't want to replicate domain knowledge into the clients. Um, use hypermedia and late binding. In other words, like don't expect a certain field to have a certain set of values unless you can actually pick up changes at runtime over hard-coded URIs and interactions. Prefer protocol knowledge over domain knowledge. Test verified documentation over statically derived uh, docs. And um, documentation and specification that's actually part of the API over separate developer documentation. That's about it. I'll be around for, yeah, at least this evening, tomorrow. If you want to come see my other talk tomorrow, my workshop, actually, I'm happy to see you also. If you have any questions, I'm the short guy with the hat. That's it. Take care. <laughs>